Got it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I, I, it's, um, it's really uh, an honor to be invited. I was, I was very surprised um, when Phil emailed me um, to, let, to ask if, I, if, if I'd be able to do this. And my response was, you know, a couple things. One, where did you get my name? Uh, but the other thing was, I, I said, I'm not a chemist. I'm not an engineer. Um, I do chemical engineering, but my chemical engineering is both really primitive and it's also very secret. <laughs> so so I, I can't really discuss chemistry today. I'll discuss it a tiny bit. Um, but, um, but we had breakfast and um, it was definitely worth it on my part. And we, um, we um, sort of talked a little bit about what it was that I might be able to address today. And what I thought I would talk about is, um, is my experience, um, and to use Mike Solomon's phrase, which I just love, my experience as an accidental engineer, um, and, and what I've been doing over the past couple years, um, trying to bring an engineering idea out of my laboratory at, at U of M and out into the real world. And, and so that um, is what I call engineering in the valley of death. So the story starts actually in clermont Ferrand. Has anyone here been there? Clermont-Ferrand's in sort of south central France. It's where Michelin Tire started. Um, but it's also uh, more interesting because just south of town is a little hill called the Puy de Dome, which is an extinct volcano, which is where Pascal carried a barometer to the top of the mountain to show that barometric pressure was a thing that actually happened in this town. Blaise Pascal grew up in this town. Um, and I was there visiting a collaborator um, in September of 2013, so about three and a half years ago. Um, and during that couple weeks day, which was just wonderful, um, I found myself um, on a conference call with the National Science Foundation one evening. Um, and the conversation we were having was about an idea that we'd had in our lab and whether or not the NSF would be interested in, in helping us run that through a um, commercialization um, sort of assessment that was being done at, um, at UC Berkeley at the business school. Um, and we, um, we were on a conference call in I think six different time zones to make that happen. Um, and, and the consensus was that maybe we had an idea that might be worth doing something with and that it might be worth something other than an interesting scientific question, but there might actually be a commercializable um, entity sort of hiding in that idea. So what we'd been thinking about were all of the really amazing new technologies um, that are available for doing um, work on single cells. Um, and this could be flow cytometry based strategies, it could be any number of platforms that have, um, that have been developed and are currently in development to work with single cells. Um, there's enormous possibility there in terms of tumor diagnostics, in terms of fetal diagnostics, and the market, I mean, every day you learn about some new strategy for working with very small samples and working with cells for diagnostic purposes or therapy. I um, mean, we'd been thinking about that problem a lot, but not in the sort of usual way. We'd been thinking about how all that technology suffers on the front end. Um, so it's really great um, to take a sample, put a single cell in it, and have an instrument do something brilliant. It's another thing to take a real life sample and put it in that instrument. We knew a few things about that. We knew that. Um, that, that most really high-end analytical instruments are starting with material that's, that's mostly just a hassle. It's not the stuff you want to see. Somewhere in that sample is the analyte of interest, but most of the sample has nothing to do with that. We knew that mechanically a lot of biological samples were a huge headache, especially once you started dealing with microfluidic issues. We knew that, um, that the process of getting a sample ready to use in a high-end instrument frequently changed the nature of the analyte so that by the time you got to the measurement, you weren't really measuring what you thought you were. Um, and we knew that half a million dollar instruments could very quickly be brought down by 100 microliters of sample that had been handled in the wrong way. Just sort of an example, the flow cytometry program at University of California has a webcam on every instrument at every university so they don't have to come in in the middle of the night to try to unclog the instruments that can talk the user through trying to get the thing back online. And those are each of them, you know, typically a hundred or half a million dollars, quarter of a million dollars, um, but they fail all the time. And they fail not because the technology is bad, but because of the junk that you're putting in. Um, and so we were not thinking about some new analytical strategy. We were thinking about is there something that you could do to try to improve the ability of, of a user to get the critical analyte out of a complicated sample. Um, there were lots of ways of doing that, but the, the way that had been 
really used most in the life sciences is, is this technology, which is to use magnetic beads. And so um, a very common strategy for pulling a cell out of a sample or pulling a protein or a nucleic acid out of a sample is to uh, take a small magnetic particle, 15 nanometers up to a couple microns, uh, conjugate it with some type of either antibody or nucleic acid so that it can recognize a target in a sample. You mix everything up and then you apply a magnetic field and you can pull a captured target um, out of a sample. And it's, it's really brilliant. It's been used for about 30 years. Uh, there are several companies that are in this business now. Um, and it's, it's often very useful. But when you go talk to users, they'll tell you that there are some really fundamental problems. And, and if you really boil it down, kind of the fundamental problem with all of these systems is how magnetism scales with length. You can't really change that. It's the nature of the universe, right? But the problem is, is that magnetic fields fall off very quickly. Uh, they're typically very complex in their sort of form um, within a sample. And so what you end up doing is taking a sample of any particular size and moving it into a geometry that looks like this. Um, and um, that works great, especially if you only have four samples to do. And all those samples happen to be about an ml. Right? So if you have 10,000 samples to do, all of which are a microliter, or you have one sample to do, which is a, you know, a 2,500 liter reactor, um, that doesn't work anymore. Um, and so we knew that there were some issues there. And when you talk to a whole bunch of users of magnetic systems, they'll start to tell you, you know what, it's actually not that great, um, but it's what we have. And so at the same time, we had been thinking about um, this stuff. Um, that's why I was talking to Owens Corning this morning so much. Uh, so this is a, a fairly classic uh, material science construct. This is a syntactic foam made out of a resin and a glass microspheres. And this stuff's also been around for a very long time. Um, and the glass microspheres are incorporated in this material to render it um, hard but very lightweight. Um, and, um, and there are several manufacturers of this material in the world, um, and they make train cars full of this stuff. Um, the parking lots of every parking lot here are full of cars that are full of this type of material. And so this stuff is out there a lot. The element that we thought was really interesting were the bubbles, were the actual spheres. And the spheres are interesting because uh, they're about the right size for doing um, analytical work in life science samples. Um, and they also respond you know, to gravity instead of to magnetism. And so there are some things that they will do differently um, when you allow them to move in their sort of field of choice. And so what we came up with was an idea of taking one of these glass shells, and the ones that we use are about 15 microns across. They're a variety that you can go out and, and track down in the world. Um, and we cover them with a linker. Um, that's all that I'm going to say about the chemistry. <laughs> There's the stuff, and I drew it with a green crayon. Um, and, then, um, and then we cover it with antibodies. And so we can cover these spheres with antibodies. Um, and as long as you keep the density low, um, with, with this material, and it's pretty easy to keep that density low, you can teach them to go grab analytes out of a biological sample and float them, kind of like a life preserver. And that's what's happening here. So, um, so these are two of our particles that have engaged three uh, T lymphocytes out of a patient sample, and they're in the process of lifting that um, out of a sample up into a reservoir where they can be collected for a downstream analytical purpose. And so that's really what, um, that's what we did. Um, and so it, it works. Um, we had a lot of people say, okay, great. Um, um, Jorg and I had long conversations about whether or not there was anything novel here whatsoever. Um, there probably isn't. Um, that's okay. Um, but the question immediately came up, and the thing that prompted the conversation with the National Science Foundation was, what do we do now? Um, we could write a paper about it, but honestly, putting antibodies on glass is not anything particularly new. Um, these bubbles have been around forever. Um, and um, and we're like, do, you know, is there even a grant hiding in here, right? Is there, is there anything there at all? Um, and it wasn't really clear. I'd been at U of M at that point for 21 years and had been down one path every single time. And that path is have an idea, start writing papers about it, write some grants about it, and start declaring in your papers and in your grants what an incredibly great idea this is and how useful it's going to be someday. Um, and I'd done that for a couple of decades. Um, and I had never really sort of called my own bluff on that last part where you say, was there actually anything useful here or not? And so we decided that maybe this wasn't worth a paper. But after talking to a handful of users and then more and more users, we said maybe there's something actually here that we could 
that, that people might want to buy. Um, and so in March of 2014, so three years ago now, um, we launched an LLC. Um, and this is the smallest little shell of a company that you can form. Uh, we called it Acadium Life Sciences. Um, there, there are like three stories um, in, in our history about why we named it Acadium, but mostly we named it Acadium because we had an advisor that says your company has to start with an A and it has to have a hard consonant to follow. Um, and so there we said, well, that works, so we can get that to work. And so, uh, um, and, that, and, then, and the company was formed and we were born. Um, and, and so, um, so, and we were hoping to do this. We were hoping to make the simplest cell separation strategy ever. Um, so, um, so a startup has, so I know one person in the room, Darren's been in a startup. Has anyone else here been an actual, honest to goodness startup that like that was their job? Yeah, so I don't know if I can recommend it. Um, <laughs> so, so a startup, um, so I like this definition of a startup. This is, this is what it is. So a startup is a temporary organization formed uh, to search for a repeatable and scalable business model, all right? A startup, we're, when we formed our LLC, we were legally a company, but that was about the extent to which we were a company. We didn't have anything, right? There's nothing about it. But what we were trying to do was launch a search party to say, does anybody want this thing? Right? It's a really brutal hypothesis. It's the hypothesis, which is somebody wants this. Right? Um, not that you think it's important, not that you can't fill your bibliography with references to other people that say it's important, but does somebody actually want it from you? And so a startup is launched to go out and try to find that, and that's, that's what we did. So the search begins in something that's been called the Valley of Death, which I like. Um, it, it probably scares some people off. The Valley of Death is not where you go to die. The Valley of Death is where the idea goes to die, right? So the question that gets answered in the Valley of Death is, does anybody really want this? And the, the typical way this is described is, um, is actually usually in sort of the interface between academia and industry, where someone in, in academia will come up with a really cool idea and, and then industry is left trying to figure out what the heck they're going to do with it and how they're going to get to actually scale, how are they going to make it, who wants it, how are they going to sell it, how are they going to figure out how much it costs. That there's this big chasm there where you go from an interesting idea to something that can actually turn into a product. There's a tremendous amount of space and that distance has been called the valley of death. And I think it's, it's reasonably appropriate. Um, I think about it um, more economically. Uh, than in some sort of, you know, how do we, you know, how do we, you know, spiritually get this idea into a product um, form? But, uh, no, this is about money. Um, and um, in, in any successful enterprise, the front end of any successful enterprise has a history that sort of looks like this. Um, at time zero, you start dumping money into that idea, and you keep dumping until at some point later on, the idea starts to return some money, and then ultimately starts to make you money. That's the goal. Of, of, any, of any early startup. That's what they're trying to accomplish. There's a point where you start to actually get it out the door when you sell the product to someone, which is the time to market. Um, there's the time to profit, which is downstream a little bit, when you actually are selling enough that you bring more money in than you put into the company. Um, and then out there somewhere um, in the end is, um, is where you actually start to make real profit. Um, the valley of death um, in this instance is this trough. And that trough is where you're dumping cash in and you don't know what's going to happen, right? So this is a trajectory you're hoping to see, but that's not necessarily the trajectory you're going to see. The trajectory that you're statistically more likely to see is you start dumping cash in and you keep dumping cash in and then everybody quits because it's not going to work, right? So that about 80% of the time, this, um, this never makes this inflection. It just, you just dump in money and then it's gone. Um, it's um, a very scary place because you don't know a few things. You don't know where that intersection happens in the future. That intersection could be two years from now, it could be 10 years from now. So you don't know how long you have to wait until you get this bump up and you start to actually sell, sell stuff. You don't know how deep the hole is. So you don't know, is that a million dollars in? Is that a hundred million dollars in? You have no idea how deep you're gonna go before you get back out. And then lastly, you don't know much about the slope once you get out of the hole. Right? And so um, understanding those things helps you understand, is this something that I'm going to spend time of my life on? Right? If, if it's going to take 20 years to get to the point where you can actually do it, and it's going to cost you $100 million, the slope out here is going to have to be something really dramatic to make it worth your while. But at the, at the onset, at this point, you just don't know very much about that function at all. Um, and it makes it 
it makes it very hard um, to sort of make decisions about going forward and, and how you're going to sort of proceed. Um, and there have been a lot of lessons that I've learned sort of walking along this plot. Um, so the first lesson that I learned, which I think is probably the most important one, um, has to do with elves. And so there's, in the European tradition, there's a, you know, there's this great, um, although I, I don't know the moral of the story at all, there is a great um, folk tale of, of a uh, shoemaker and his wife who are on the verge of bankruptcy. They have enough leather to make one more pair of shoes. They leave the leather out in their workshop um, and go to bed, you know, but the plan of coming back the next morning, making the last pair of shoes, and then getting out of town. They come back in the morning, and the shoes have magically been made overnight. They don't know how it happened. They left out the leather. They came in the morning. The shoes were there. So they sell the shoes. They get enough money to get two pieces of leather, leave them out, and come back the next day. And now there's two pairs of shoes. And that goes on for a while, and they ultimately discover that in the evening, elves are sneaking into the workshop and making the shoes for them, right? So that's great. That doesn't actually happen, okay? <laughs> so the elves will not be making an appearance for your idea, right? And so you can disclose your idea uh, to the tech transfer office. You can actually write a patent application if you're so inclined. Uh, you can publish about how great it is all you want. But in the end, um, if your idea is gonna go forward, in most instances, it's going forward because you're gonna go make the shoes, right? And that's how it's gonna actually happen. And it's, um, and, it, it's hard because it's, it's not an easy job and it's, it's not very glamorous. But in the end, the way that your ideas are going to go forward is you're going to be the one that takes them there. So the basic algorithm for getting through the valley of death is this. It's very easy. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a sort of a four next loop. And two conditions have to be met every turn of the crank. One is you, if, as long as you still have revenue that's less than the money that you're putting in, and two, you have any cash in the bank to make payroll, you will do these things. You will go out and try to find money to get the idea done, you will try to identify anyone in the world who might have an interest in what you're making and get them to try it. You will get something into their hands, whatever that might be. You will then learn from how badly that experience went and you'll lick your wounds. You'll refine the product when needed. If you have to redesign, you will. If you have to completely reinvent, you will. You'll try to keep everyone on the team together so they don't all quit. Um, and then you will turn that crank again. Um, and that's what living in a startup is like. Um, this is where engineering <laughs> becomes humble um, because at the beginning, you don't have the resources to make something glamorous. You have the resources to make something that's barely enough um, to meet what you think somebody needs. And then they're gonna tell you very frankly whether or not you were right. Um, when we started the company, there were two of us. This is Brandon McNaughton, um, my co-founder and I. Uh, when we started in uh, 14, so in the summer of 14, we actually had a table. It was 72 inches by 48 inches. We did not have a lab. Uh, we just had a table um, at an incubator downtown. And for the first year of the company, we actually ran the company off this table. Um, and, um, and there was very little, um, very little resources to work with. And what we started with was what we called version zero. And so version zero of this thing that we were attempting to engineer um, was simply the idea. Um, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to go out and put this into people's hands and say, I have an idea. Um, we mocked up bottles, they were empty. Um, uh, we roamed the halls at the university and walked around to people that we knew and people we didn't know and said, hey, we have this thing. Um, would you be interested in trying it? Um, and everyone said, oh yeah, that's great. We'd love to try it. So that's great. What we need you to do is just give us a purchase order for it. Um, and if we get enough purchase orders, we'll make it. And it costs $400 a bottle, right? So this part's really super easy. This part is really, really hard the first time. The first time you walk to a colleague and say, I have this stuff. It's, I think this may actually solve your problem. They're like, oh yeah, we definitely want to try it. It's like, well, okay. So give me the purchase order. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll figure out how we're going to manufacture it, and in about eight weeks, we'll have it to you, and, and, and it'll be 400 bucks, right? If we don't manufacture it, you don't get charged, but we need the purchase order to proceed. Um, everyone loves it right up to this point. Um, and then, and then, it, then it's, a completely different, it's a completely different task after that, uh, because then they have to really love it. And so what you learn by doing that is you start to learn what, does, what are you going to be engineering? What is the thing you're going to make? Um, and you don't start making it until you understand what people need. And what we, what we learned was what people might want to do with the stuff if we could actually make it, um, how much they were likely going to need. Okay, were they going to use it once every 12 months or were they going to use it once you know, a day? 
we learned kind of how much they're willing to pay, right? So did they cough at $400? They say, yeah, that sounds fine. Um, and we really learned how to distinguish someone telling you they had a really cool idea from telling you that they want to place an order for the idea, right? Those are really fundamentally different. Within academia, everyone loves most ideas, right? <laughs> and it's great, right? But at some point, for, if it's gonna live, if it's gonna survive, you have to be able to transition from the, this is a really interesting idea to, yeah, this is something that I actually probably need. Um, and thinking about your research in that capacity. So think about what you're gonna write your dissertation on and whether or not you could sit down with someone today and say, I've been working on this for about three years, you know, you know it needs to, I need to make about $500,000 with this idea, you know, you know, do you have five hundred thousand dollars? Right? Can you ask them on that? And how would you approach them? What would you? What? What? What's the value in what you're doing that you could ask them on that? But ultimately, it has to be done. The ideas have to be turned into marketable ideas. Um, so, um, and so the way that you you sort of work through that is you go out and you just bust your hump and you do very humiliating things like work at a booth. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I, was in, when I was at the university, I would walk through trade shows and I would just walk past every one of these things looking to see what's free at this booth that I could take away right now and, uh, and, just, and, never, and just never look. Just don't make eye contact. Just walk by, pick up the free stuff and go. Um, and, and so sitting on the other side of one of these tables is a really useful experience because then what you're doing is saying, here's the idea that I have and I'm going to sit here and you can come by, you can take my free stuff and if you want to, you can talk to me a little bit about this. But this is, um, this is how you do it. And the second really important lesson that we learned is, is that, um, that if you need to understand is my idea significant or not, there's really nothing like someone saying, please get this done so that we can have it, right? We, we will place an order for this so we can have this idea working in our shop right away. And it's a, it's a really different way of thinking about, um, about you know, how to size up the value of your work. So when we had version zero done, we, we understood enough about what we would take out um, and put in the customer's hands. And so this is the only chemistry I'm gonna talk about today. So the thing that we made first is really bad. <laughs> It was pretty bad. So we, we took glass bubbles um, that we, you know, just were available commercially. We used isoelectric absorption to slam some egg white um, avidin onto the bubble so that it could engage a biotinylated molecule. Uh, we didn't really understand blocking agents. We didn't have any preservatives. And we had hardly ever worked with human cells in this capacity at all. Um, but but it, it did work, right? And so it did accomplish what we needed it to do. Um, and that was it could isolate cells. Um, and when we took it out, um, we talked to customers that would do a couple different things. One is they might be trying to capture a particular cell of interest out of a sample, but more often what we learned is what they really wanted to do was get rid of stuff that they didn't want anymore. And so a lot of our customers say, what I want to do is I want to use your bubble to lift stuff away from the thing that really matters. Um, and that was not something we had anticipated, uh, but it's something that we could do. And so this is just a video of kind of how it works. And so we call that cell depletion. Um, and what a customer will do is they'll take a sample. Um, it's you know, typically about this size. In this case, it happens to be contaminated with red cells. This is the product. This, are, um, this is a suspension of our antibody-coated microbubbles. Uh, you mix it with the sample. Um, it's, 30, um, or it's, it's one minute of mixing, 30 strokes with a pipetter. Um, and then you put in centrifuge. The customer's target cells, the things they want to capture, go to the bottom. Um, everything else gets floated to the top. You suck it off, throw it in the trash, and you're done. And that's, that's it. Right? That's, that's how customers use it. And, um, and some of the initial responses were amazing, right? So we had a customer honestly say it was like magic, right? So they, they, were, they were actually trying to purify stem cells out of a human bone marrow sample. And they're like, this is, this is incredible, right? And so, um, so you hear that, and you're like, this, now we're talking, right? That's exactly what I wanted. Um, it's great, it lets you know that things are working, but it's not necessarily criticism you can go forward with. It doesn't help you make the product better. Other people were more than happy to help you make the product better. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a, a transcript from a phone conversation that um, one of the four of the people in our company did with an early customer. I never want to use it again, it's not worth the trouble, there's no obvious gain. I wanted to help John, but I'm not a blue sky person. The Robustness is not there. I am risk averse. It's so not ready for prime time. Buoyancy is not the key to success. I hardly ever ask for my money back, but I do want it back. Um, and I'm willing to meet with John for two minutes on Monday to show him what happened, right? And so that's actually really useful. That's really, inf it's useful information because it tells you a lot of things about how what you thought you designed um, fell short when it actually went out into the world. And so one of the really important lessons we learned was that if you have customers 
that, that desperately need what you're trying to do for them, right? They really need the solution that you're proposing that they will help you get this done, right? So if someone wants it perfect and they don't want to think about it at all, that person may or may not be much value to you as someone in your development pipeline. But if there's someone that says, I can't move my work forward, until this problem is solved. If you're there to try to solve that problem, you have their attention and they will help you engineer through that problem. And it's, it's, it's incredibly valuable. So when that customer told us that they just hated working with the product, a lot of what they hated actually ultimately came down to the way that working with the microbubbles felt in a pipette tip. Um, and, and what we, we call it hand feel. And so it's how do the particles move in suspension? And that ultimately, um, that's, you know, that's kind of colloidal type stuff, right? It's like, you know, what are the interactions between the particles? What are the interactions between the particles and the container when they have cells on them, when they have antibodies conjugated to them? And so there are a lot of deep issues in, in what that customer told us about, you know, how do we make this product better? And it's not just like, well, you know, it's just fundamentally wrong. No, it's, 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 it could be right, but, but the material is just not designed quite right yet. And so the customers will walk you through it. And when I was at the U, um, we were sort of core technology people. I mean, most of my ideas in my career were sort of core technology ideas. And with this idea, you know, you got this particle, there's a, there's a protein coating on it, um, you're trying to capture cells. You can sort of imagine that, you know, when you think about how could it go wrong, it goes wrong, you know, the chemistry could be wrong, something with the surface forces could be wrong, there could be issues with how the antibodies presented to the target on the bubble. And those are kind of, that's kind of where you leave it, and because those are all things that are easy to sort of put your head around, that's not actually where the trouble is. The trouble is not usually in the core technology. The trouble's in everything else. And so how do you make it? How do you make it today and then make it in a week and have it be the same stuff that you made today? And so how do you get from you know, making a single replicate to making 100 replicates? How do you scale up? How do you make your reaction four times the size it is now um, and not mess up the product? Um, the whole idea of sort of validation, verification, and testing was completely foreign to us, right? When you start with a new product and you're trying to do quality control, you don't even know what you're supposed to be measuring. What is the feature that you're supposed to measure to let you know that you built the right thing and that it's, it's consistent? And we rethink quality control all the time. It's, I, I do more quality control sort of work um, in the shop than I do really anything else. The manufacturing it kind of takes care of itself. It's monitoring the manufacturing that becomes so hard. Stability testing, will it survive a FedEx trip? Will it survive six weeks sitting on someone's shelf? Um, how do you package it? How do you ship it? How do you document to the customer what they're gonna do with it? And then how do you support them once they have it? We've had really just dramatic failures in every one of these in the past three years. We've had something just, you know, we had a big shipment go to California and, and the customer says, well, the lids came off all the bottles. <laughs> like, well, no, they didn't. It's like, no, they really came off all the bottles. So, you know, we've had everything fail. And, um, and I think, you know, the thing that makes me an accidental engineer at this point is that I own, except for this, um, within the company, I own all of this. There's only four of us. I have to make it, I have to QC it, I have to design the QC, I do all the stability testing, I put it in boxes, I send it to FedEx, um, and taking an idea and getting it to the point where it can survive some scale um, in shipment has really been, it's been the most professionally um, rewarding thing I've worked on probably in a decade. Um, but it, it's very humbling. Um, just to give you an idea, right, right now with our main product, we track 90 variables in statistical process control around how we make this stuff. We don't know which ones are important, um, but we track everything because we, we're learning sort of what's important over time. And, and so I know the 10 most variable features of the manufacturing process. I know the manufacturing process is really cold. Um, and, um, and it's just, all this stuff has to be learned from scratch. You just don't know in advance where you're gonna go. The next thing that comes up when you're trying to do this is how do you keep cash greater than zero? So how do you put money in the bank? Um, the real risk here is that before you can get to this inflection and get up out of the hole, that you run out of money. Um, there are lots of different ways to finance um, these ideas. You can do it uh, in part through grants. There are mechanisms by which you can get some cash to try to move the idea forward. But ultimately, the way you move forward is with venture investment. Um, and so I think this is, 
This is the essence of venture capital. Um, and um, and it's, there's just nothing bad. This is the greatest scene the, of the entire movie, Finding Nemo. The very best line is this line, hop into my mouth if you want to live. Um, and this is, this is um, the offer that's made to you um, when a venture investor comes and says, we're here to help you figure this out. Um, it's easy to sort of feel victimized. You know, so I, I'm lying on the dock, I have no oxygen left at all, there's nothing. If we don't get some help right now, we're done. It's easy to feel like you're really vulnerable. But the truth is, is that the albatross also has an issue here, right? Is that he doesn't know that you're not a poisonous fish, right? And so you're trying to survive. Um, this guy's gonna get you out of trouble, but at the same time, you could take him down as well. And so, um, and so this, um, this arrangement between investment and the company is, is one of the most interesting aspects of it. I, I think of, of all the things I've learned, and I've learned a lot of chemistry in the past couple of years, I think the things I've really learned I had no clue about was how do you engage with investors successfully? Um, and there's lots of examples of doing that well in the world, and there's lots of examples of doing it poorly. Um, I think we've done it pretty well so far. But in the end, for us to keep the company going, we had to go raise investment. Now at the time, um, I think it's useful to remember where I was. So I'd been at faculty at U of M for over 20 years. I was a full professor. I had two R01s from the NIH and NSF funding. So it was, I was pretty much a made guy um, at that point. I, I was just stepping off as the associate chair for research. I was on the dean's executive committee at the medical school. And I had been on the um, biointerfaces um, executive committee. And, um, and I've had people tell me that of all the people in the university who would leave, um, it's not you, right? You're not the guy that was gonna leave, but I did. Um, and so on June 10th of 2015, I resigned. Um, and it was um, quite surprising to actually make that jump. My, um, my wife knew I was gonna do it, she says, long before I realized that I was gonna do it. I didn't really realize until that spring that it was gonna happen. But the reason that it happened was because we'd seen enough with the company to know that it was worth a shot and that, and that there was something there that might be of value. And because of that, we needed to go raise money. Who in this room has money invested in the stock market? Right. So none of you would invest in a mutual fund where someone said, we're gonna take some money, we're gonna give to this guy at a university. He's actually not gonna quit his day job, but his idea and his company are so good that we're gonna give him some money anyway. No, you're gonna give money and you want your guys to give money to people who are all in. And so the way that we were able to raise money successfully in the first part of the company is to show this is good enough that we're gonna give it a try, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna go all in. All the founders are coming in, we're coming in 100%, and we're gonna give this a shot. And once we said we're committed enough to this idea that we're, gonna, that we're doing it, um, then it became actually fairly straightforward to help raise a round of investment and get people on board that could come help with the, with the project. So this is, um, this is a photograph of us the day we started signing away the company. So this is the day we became a Delaware C Corporation. I mean, we raised, um, um, and this is the, the last week we were at this table, which we were happy to go, get rid of. But so the first round we raised about a million dollars um, in venture funding, um, and that was enough to keep the company going for a little bit over a year. Um, and that deal was done in part because we said, we're gonna, give, we're gonna commit to this, we're gonna give it a, a serious try. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to people about all the nuances of that, but that's, um, that's what, how it happened. And so once we had the investment for the idea, we were able to get some lab space. And so this is, um, uh, this is our world headquarters now. So this is down on South State Street. It's just sort of south of Ellsworth um, on State Street. Uh, this is what a venture-backed biotechnology company looks like. Okay, there are two rooms. Um, the beauty of the iPhone panoramic view is that it makes everything look like a panorama. <laughs> <laughs> so the combined space of these two rooms are significantly smaller than the room that we're standing in right now, and that's the entire company. There's not like an office suite somewhere, right? There's nothing, this is it. Um, there's, a, there's a room with a bench here, and there's a room with a bench in the middle, and that's, that's the extent of the company. The, um, all of the company's desks um, and office space are in this room. Because we have one part of our chemistry that hap happens in that hood, we can't drink coffee in our office, and so outside of the door, we have a row of chairs in the hallway where we go sit in the morning and just drink coffee, and then we go into the office and get work done. But we can't actually drink in the room because we do chemistry in the room. Um, and this is, this is the entirety of it. 
Um, and so we, out of this room, we do all of our R&D, we do all of our manufacturing. Uh, we've shipped to eight states and three different countries now um, and to have product evaluated. And so it doesn't take a lot of space to do it. You know, the goal in that trough is to burn money as slowly as possible. And so you don't buy a lot of infrastructure. You try to keep the infrastructure costs as low as you can. Um, we lease equipment from the university. So we don't, there's no other equipment that the lab has. This is everything we have. Uh, we lease flow cytometry time. We lease um, spectroscopy time, um, um, electron mic microscope time. We lease it from the U. Um, but otherwise, everything else is done down there. We have four products, and so a couple years in, we have four products online. Um, they're just variations on this sort of bubble theme, and that's, um, that's the, the company's product line right now. Um, we are um, always working on our search engine optimization. So if you Google cell separation, depending on what day, um, what day you look, um, there are days when we beat Thermo, and there's days when we lose. This day we lost. We were fourth. Um, in search, opti search engine optimization, but we actually have strategies. We have a person that works specifically on trying to make sure when someone searches for terms related to what we do that we beat all the competition so the customers see us first. I mean, that's actually a thing. That's a, something that we spend time working on. So the last um, lesson uh, that I will um, sort of convey is um, I think the importance of being able to take a shot um, and to try something. Um, one of the things that you don't realize, I think, in, in sort of where you are in your training right now, is that you have, you're on the verge of finishing you know, the greatest increase in your ability to make an impact in the world that you probably will do in the rest of your career, right? So where you were before you started graduate school and where you're going to be at the end, your capacity to change the world has gone up significantly, right? You are, you are a much, um, a much more... Um, capable agent of making change in the world than you were before. And, um, and my hope for you is that um, as your career goes forward, there, there will be times when it's, time to make it, when it's time to change the world and there'll be times when it's not yet time to change the world, but that you'll sort of remember that, that some amazing things can happen, but what you have to be prepared for is to be modest in what you're going to try to accomplish, right? We're not trying to change the world. We're not rolling out the greatest technology ever. We have something that we think people want, and we want to try to make their lives better. We want that research that they're doing to go better. We want the diagnostics to go better. And we're prepared to go out with a fairly humble proposition. Here's what we're trying to do. Help us make this better. Help us make your work better, and try to do that. Um, I don't have the sense that I could have successfully done that to the extent that I've done it successfully so far. I don't have the sense that I could have done that in my previous position, mostly because I was really comfortable in my previous position. And I had sort of the things I'd gotten accomplished accomplished. I knew that, you know, that if I didn't want to go into work tomorrow, I just wouldn't go into work. I'd just work from home. Um, but I was, I was in a good spot. I'd sort of been in a spot that I've been driving towards for most of my career. But I, I came to the realization that, that my ability to impact change um, was, was maybe less than it could be because I'd, I'd found myself in a comfortable spot. And so I think what I really learned the most was um, there are times to go out and take a risk and, and give yourself a chance to see what will happen. Um, you, 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 know, you prepare for that. You guard for the risks associated with doing something like quitting your day job, right? You have to, you have to do some planning for that. But in the end, there's, there's opportunities to go out and, and you know, potentially make, you know, real game-changing, you know, advances to the world. And, and, and so I, I would just leave you with the idea that you can do that. Um, it, it's hard. It, it looks difficult. Um, lots of things have to happen. But, but you, you can actually do some amazing things. And things that start humbly, um, like I think this is, this is how I think about our product. This is our product right now. It's Charlie Brown's, like the worst Christmas tree ever. Things that do start humbly can actually do um, some fairly amazing things. And so our goal is to try to make this Christmas tree a little bit brighter. Um, but it can be done. And I think in, anyone can do it. And, um, and I'd be happy to talk about sort of any of the mindset, any of the decisions that we made. I can talk about our technology a little bit. Uh, but that's um, where I'll just sort of leave my opening thoughts and say, um, say thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions.